next lecture will be a moving lecture. Please start moving into the South Ballroom so there'll be more room. Dr. Bach is going to be down among you eventually. He'll need room to walk around and you need room to breathe. So just start moving over that way, please. Folks, we're still coming in. We can't all get right in here. Thank you. Welcome to the second evening of the Human Sexuality Symposium at Iowa State University. I have a couple of announcements to make as we begin. First of all, for those of you who uh, would like to have a copy of a tape or to listen to a tape of the lecture afterwards, this, uh, this lecture is being taped. The tape will be placed in the library, will be available in the reference room and in room 50 in the library if you'd like a copy of the tape. I've been also asked to uh, announce that there's no smoking. I don't see anyone smoking yet, so the sign must be working pretty good. Tomorrow, the symposium continues at 9 o'clock from 9 till 12. George Bach and Lorene Nichol Nicholson will be leading the workshop on aggression and sex. The film festival will be going again from 9 till 4. The same films will be shown only in a different order so that if you were not able to get uh, to the film festival at a particular time today, the film that was shown then will be shown at a different time. Also note that the place of the film festival has been changed. It's now located in room 205 upstairs in Memorial Union. At 12 noon, lunch with George Bach and Lurie Nicholson in the Cyclone Cellar for anyone who would like to come and sit and chat. The contraception exhibit, 11, 11.30. The luncheon is at 11.30, I'm sorry, that's a correction. 11.30 in the Cyclone Cellar. At 1 o'clock, the contraception exhibit and presentation by Kay Carey will be given in the sunroom. At 4.10, Dr. David Welfa will have books and cokes discussing Born to Win and Primal Scream. At 8 o'clock tomorrow night, Anna Gross will give her presentation, when to talk, when to talk, and how to talk about it if we're going to do it, topic on contraception. And also, I draw your attention to the display room in room 211 of Memorial Union, where you'll find some resources on the general topic of human sexuality. This evening, we're very fortunate to have Dr. George Bach and Lurie Nicholson. Dr. Bach is the president of the American Society for the Scientific Study of Sex, the West Coast region. This was the uh, old Kinsey Foundation, where Kinsey did his initial work on uh, sexuality. You will find other information about Dr. Bach in your bulletin and uh, on the backs of books. I see some of you have. Lurie Nicholson is an aggression lab leader at UCLA. She uh, does this aggression lab in pairing. She also teaches classes in pairing and in parent-child fighting. What we're going to try to do tonight is to give you, in about three hours, what it usually takes 15 to 30 hours to do in coursework in Los Angeles. Dr. Bach and Lurie Nicholson are experts on aggression and hostility and how to handle it in helpful ways so that it's to be not destructive. This is going to be a participation lecture. You are encouraged to do everything to participate all the way. You don't have to agree with everything that Dr. Bach and Ms. Nicholson are going to do, but please participate. Get involved in it. The chairs are for those who cannot sit on the floor for some sort of physical reason. Everyone else is requested to sit on the floor and to participate fully. When Dr. Bach gets into the presentation, he will be moving out into the audience uh, to get you more involved. Dr. Bach and Ms. Nicholson. In California, sex is not a dirty word. It is time for the Midwest to catch up with the West Coast. And I'm so glad that your committee 
which is struggling against great odds on this campus to introduce viable sexual exchange of information, of sexual information, has seen fit to continue against great odds to maintain these type of programs. There are many people on this and other campuses who are sad tonight to see you come out like this. They would love to see just two or three people come to this. So thank you very much for being here. And spread the word that sex is here to stay <laughs> and that it is beautiful and nothing to be hidden from, certainly not from discussion, and that there's much to learn in an area because this area has been kept under wraps in the very institution of learning where we otherwise are justly proud to deal with new experiments, with new research and new discoveries. So tonight, it is my real pleasure to try to go over, as your chairman pointed out, in rather condensed fashion, an introduction to the area of sexuality which is a taboo within a taboo. In other words, I assume that you and I are aware that sex is beautiful, that love is beautiful, but we are also aware that this blissful state of paradisical, joyful sex and love is rarely attained. And that therefore, our basic assumption must be, A, that it is difficult, or B, that it is, that we go about it in wrong ways. In other words, it is either intrinsically difficult, even if we know everything about it, or it is difficult primarily because we are ignorant or clumsy in going about it. Well, actually, I think both is true. Even among the most sexually actualized people, there's always the problem of exiting of a relationship, coming to a climax, if I may use that word, in connection with longitudinal development, peak experiences, and then valleys and disappointments and exits. The ratio of divorce is not only matched, divorce to marriage, is not only matched, namely a three to one ratio, but is exceeded by the ratio of quick dates, dates which, which impairing, which develop sexuality, and then exit or separate. After all, these facts, these statistical facts, of the relatively fleetingness, fleetingness of sexual intimacy and of intimacy in general, have given us a great deal of material about what leads to break, breaking, exiting intimate relationships once they're established. And I want to go over with you briefly a model for an intimate relationship of what a couple, a pair, that has come to the point of mutual agreement to be sexually involved, what kind of information is helpful for them to discover about each other in order to then be in a better position to judge the intimacy potential, the growth potential for that particular relationship and in order to preserve that which is beautiful in it and to confront that which is conflictful in it. For the taboo within the taboo is the anger which is intrinsic in any interdependent relationship. It is a very confusing thing when one gets angry with the very one that one loves or wants to be loved by. 
So we have developed methods of how to deal with this anger in ways which we call rituals or plays or games good, or just simply experiences. And as I go along with you, please remember this, I might become very directive because I want you to go through certain exercises and experiences. But <clears throat> there are really no shoulds and oughts. Each couple has to develop what we call a pair-specific style of dealing with certain dimensions. And I'm going to just briefly outline these dimensions so that we know what we are after when we develop a sexually involved relationship. Now it's very interesting, you know, as you know, I myself, in reminiscing a little bit, I was a uh, first a graduate student and teaching assistant and got my doctorate at the University of Iowa, Iowa City, in uh, 1942 or 43 or something like that. I was around. In those days, the problem was not will she, no, the pro in those days the problem was will she or won't she, but as Rollo Mays so beautifully put it, today the question is can she or cannot she? In other words, it's no longer the dynamics 30 years ago were more of how to meet people. We were interested in, in what to do in the first four minutes of meeting. Today we have advanced in a great way. Everybody meets everybody. We have encounter groups. We have a lot of experiences of people, how to overcome their, shall we say, primary shyness. It's what's after they meet <laughs> in interest. Now I say hello, what do I say next? I like you, what do I do with this? And here are some of the dimensions, which are, by dimensions I mean experience aspects, which we, the more information one can get vis-a-vis -vis your partner on these dimensions, the more you are in a position to learn to enjoy the intimacy. Well, first of all, is the dimension, we'll just go over them very briefly and we have some exercises to show you how to do that. The, the very first dimension is the, the, the problem of conflict, namely being able to tolerate conflict in a relationship is essential for its development. Because as soon as two people, and you hear a lot about open communication, be authentic, do your thing, she does her thing, he does his thing, well, there has to be some calibration uh, because uh, <clears throat> it's very unlikely that if you're t true and open and honest, that two people feel exactly the same in bed or out of bed as uh, together. So they have to calibrate, which means that they have to have a sense for the fact that certain accommodations have to take place. You have to go along with certain things that the other one wants. And you have to be able to assert and impact your own wants on the other person. Which means you have to get rid of being afraid of conflict. The other person might say, hey, I don't dig that, don't lay that on me. And the other person may say, you know, um, uh, that is not, you are not my ideal type. I, <laughs> if, if you want uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to make love in a certain way, that turns me off. So all these things we say yes to, when you say open communication, authenticness, we actually reinforce the person to risk being rejected. Rather than, because why, why do we say that? Because we find that one of the reasons why intimacy doesn't develop, why we have not only social, communication problems, but even after a person is interested and in, in willing to uh, go to bed with you, the sexual problems that occur in, in the bedroom are due to the fact that young partners will try to collude, we call it, with each other. They will try to pretend, you all ha heard about pretending the f female pretending orgasm. The male has a little t tougher time pretending, but they pretend passion too by making noises, uh, exaggerated noises, and um, making all kinds of stories, and uh, 
presenting themselves in a way which isn't real, but which, which, is, which is part of the courtship dance. It's very natural to do, to present yourself in a light which you may feel is the light that your partner wants to see you in. So as a result, very early, in, in the early stages of a courtship, hypotheses are developed about what the other person likes or doesn't like, which are not realistic. And we can go into great details, I'll just give you as, as, as an example, a very simple example about kissing. Now here are two people who are naked, okay? And they like each other all right. Now here there's, there's the early relationship, they started to, to neck, and um, uh, the kissing starts. Now these are two people who are in the old romantic way, are really feeling good and warm, holding each other and so forth, and they don't want to spoil that. So they let things happen that they don't really like. For example, uh, a dry kiss. Uh, he gives her a dry kiss. He thinks that she thinks that that's the kind of kiss she likes, when actually he would like to stick his tongue right in there. <laughs> she, in turn, is disappointed with this closed mouth, dry lips, but she thinks that he thinks that she would be too forward so if she would do anything about it. So she too gives him this kind of pecker pecker, <laughs> or pecker peck. So it starts off, you see, with this kind of, and you can go down the line, all the way, this kind of what we call the collusion, that you go along with something, it's even worse than that, it's what Lang calls a spiral mind reading. It's really mind raping because you don't check it out. So what we do, as you will learn, is how to mind read how to, but not mind rape a person of what they like sexually, what they don't like sexually about you. Now, we might call that the uh, dimension of uh, I, uh, your love ideology or your sexual ideology. Every person has very highly individualistic sexual ideologies. So that's, that's, to that's to say what they like or don't like as an individual section. And that we encourage to make explicit first to yourself. You won't believe it, but it's a fantastic journey of self-discovery to really ask yourself the question, you know, what, what turns me on and what turns you off? You think you know, but you don't know really as much as you really will know when you really study that. And secondly, in addition to the individualistic nature of these turns of and turn on, there is the interpersonal aspect of it. In other words, what turns uh, Joe on with Joan may turn him off with Mary. That's a fact. So you see, the individualistic idea, the personalistic theories, do not wor work very well in, sexu in sexuality. We have to expand these individualistic notions and bring into the picture the the model of interdependence, which is, of course, uh, exemplified in the collaboration and calibration during the actual intercourse, where you have to gear yourself to your partner. The partners have to gear themselves to each other in terms of all kinds of psychological dimensions. Now, this is impossible uh, unless you're just lucky, un unless you just are screwing a ghost, I mean, two ghosts getting together, you know, having, having what is uh, an illusory, uh, you know, just an ordinary, the good uh, word fuck applies. They just, they get together, you know, like uh, two machines or two ghosts, you know, and they, they have that. And this is certainly not of great interest because I think that the reason it is not of great interest is not for moral reasons. I think moralistically, personally, I don't care what people do with each other as long as they are adults and m mutually consent. And let them do that if they feel like that. But we know that people want to go beyond that into what is known as sexual love or, or love with sex. 
And there, once you have that combination, it requires reality testing. It requires that you learn how first. Learn about yourself. What turns you on and what turns you off, generally. Secondly, you have to learn what turns your partner on and off. Thirdly, you have to learn, these are the dimensions that I talked to you about. Third, you have to, to learn what in, your, in that specific pair turns you both on and off. And that requires experimentation and verbal or nonverbal cueing. Verbal and nonverbal cueing. We are much for verbal cueing in the area as well as nonverbal cueing. Because nonverbal cueing has been generally you know, understood to be the romantic way to communicate. Animals do a lot of that, you know, and we can learn a lot, and I'm all for it. But after all, one of the great advantages that we have in the human species is being able to tell each other how we feel. And let us refine the language of intimacy and sexuality so that we can learn how to tell each other and what to tell each other. Now, what shall we tell each other? First of all, we tell each other, as I said, what we like and don't like. And you will do it. In a few minutes, we'll do it. What turns you on, turns you off. We just meditate and think about it. Secondly, we have to learn to tell each other what we consider closeness. May I ask you, Ms. Nicholson, to demonstrate with me? Now, you stand right there. That's close enough for me. How about you? Yikes. How about you? Seriously. Do you like it? Yeah, we're next to right here. We're next to <laughs> And for love, how close do you like it? Well, at different times, different distances. With me. <laughs> That's close. I show you how close I love it. <laughs> how about that? Is that too close for you, too? No. No, that's not too close. I like close. You like close? Yes, lots of touching and lots of uh, physical contact. So we understand each other. Right. But for many people, why is it a problem? And, and well, for especially yeah. in the early relationship. Many times... How long have we known each other? Two years. Yeah. So we have worked out things. Haven't been there times in our relationship in which you felt that I was either too distant or too engulfing, or one or yes, the other? Yes, I many times felt that you were too distant, that you wanted to and be I away, get away. And many times I felt you were too engulfing. Right. In fact, I had dreams of you <laughs> overwhelming <laughs> me with your... Ch first of all, you fall on me in the first place. Then right? make those big arms. Yeah. <laughs> See, there you come. So, so even to an early... We're talking about early relationships. Yeah. People have to work out what we call optimal distance. And if you don't take anything else home from, from this, please remember that concept that so many people misinterpret as um, rejection, right? Actually, what you work out is what to one person, your partner might feel uh, distant, is to, to this partner just like, like a defense of his freedom of movement. He loves this person who allows to give him this, 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 this so-called distance. To him, it's not, not cold. To her, it may be cold. And then to give, give how, how, how I might feel when you come like that. Well, that, that I would be engulfing you, that I'm yeah. grabbing you. Do you feel engulfing? No. No, I, I feel engulfed. <laughs> right. But I don't feel engulfing, no. So what are we going to do about it? Well... Uh -huh. You're going to have to either learn to like it when I engulf you, or I'm going to have to learn to not feel rejected when you say, that's enough, don't touch me. But what about the, the statement that, uh, why, why should I change? Why should we lay this on each other? Maybe we're not suited, you're not my type. You want to be closer, there must be guys who love you for being closer. In other words, you, you are actually saying we have to be willing to change. Right. Willing and that means change. fighting. Doesn't it? That's right. Like I remember because many times we fight, fight a lot. You did, car, you did it again. To say you did it again. You did it again. In the car, I like you, to put my hand. And in I hate it. 
I want it. So you see. So we're still working on that one. That's right. <laughs> so for each dimension, uh, okay, thank you. For each, for each dimension, there is, there, there is this, this, this calibration to work out now. Optimal distance is one. Another one is power. The power dimension. You might think it to do with sex or love. Well, don't fool yourself. The bedroom is an enormous arena for power game. Fantastic. Who is going to tell whom, what, when? Hmm. So you have to work out when am I your master, when I'm your slave, to put it, you know, in old fashioned dichotomous terms. Actually, you know, it has to be worked out. Because there's nothing worse than two people lying in bed and wondering what the other would like to do next. <laughs> like e even, it's even bad when two people want to go to a show and don't know, you know, which movie to go to. In Hollywood, at least, we have so many, you know. Or, to, or, or what to do on a Sunday, you see. So there is th th this kind of deadlock, by the way, or stalemate that I just mentioned, where two people are caught by uh, not wanting to lead or not wanting to follow, is frequently the price we pay being cautiously democratic. The nicest people have this problem. By the way, I just finished a new book. You, I hope you will enjoy it when it comes out. It's called Stop Being So Nice, You're Killing Me. And that's an analysis of what happens when we are very nice to each other. We actually, in effect, accumulate a great deal of irritation and hostility and eventually lets this out indirectly. In bed, by not really being fully passionate, that's a real passive weapon. You know? Not really be with it. That can even be unconscious. You can hide like a, like, a, like, like a coward behind this concept of unconsciousness because it is true. Yeah? Your, your, your little genitals, you know, yeah, because your mind, you're truthful, you love to love you, love to love you, but he doesn't want to. Huh? And everybody is dumbfounded. And we find that this happens more to nice guys than to real guys. <laughs> and the ladies, you know, the, you ladies, you women, who are, you know, up here in, in your mind, in your heart, you love the guy, but your genitals don't come along, you know, again, you know, examine whether you are too nice. Dr. Kozipski, the famous old, uh, the founder of, uh, of semantics, always said, you know, the penis never lies. And neither, I like to add, neither does the vagina. When she is dry and when she isn't so swollen and when she isn't pulsing and your mind loves the guy, you better examine what your vagina is trying to tell you. Usually trying to tell you, look, you have a reservation about this relationship. Will you please take me seriously? Because that's what your vagina is trying to tell you. Head. And the same with, with uh, the guys. Now, we want not to be in this embarrassing position. I think that's one of the most embarrassing positions in the whole world. To be in bed with somebody you, you love up here, but don't do anything down there. Eh? Aren't we fortunate that we can talk like that? In the old days, we couldn't even talk about whether to do it or not to do it. We're talking about how to do it, and how to do it right, and how to, to enjoy it, and how to be with it. And one of the first principles is to watch out for the old Freudian, sorry about that, the old man had a few very good things. He knew the term resistance. Eh? Resistance. And let that genital resistance say something to you. And then try to find out where that resistance is. Now, for example, it could be the optimal distance. Maybe you feel engulfed. You don't quite know it, but you know, something, your Peter or your, your, your vagina are telling you, you know, it may be that. The other thing is the dominance that I was just mentioned, beginning to mention these. The dimension of power. You may not like to be led that much, or you may be dissatisfied that there's not enough leadership in a relationship. 
that you are that everything, all decisions are laid on you. That's a power dimension. We have a we have a ritual we'll we'll play with you called master slave, in which you can sort of experiment with the power dimension. So, so some people try to undermine my program and and spreading a rumor on campus that we are going to have an orgy here. Well, I wish they were true, <laughs> but <laughs> but. Uh, but I have uh, never succeeded in, in creating such a, such a thing. And as a matter of fact, I'd like to clarify something for you. What we are going to do tonight is in the form of a style, form of style of communicating about sensitive subjects, but are not necessarily restricted to sexuality. They apply whenever there is an intimate relationship. And it's up to you, naturally, you know, we don't want an orgy. We don't want to have anything of the sort here. What for? We want to learn something when we leave here that we can apply in the privacy of your relationship. So nonsense to this kind of talk about these type of classes. Okay, now we have the optimal distance. We have already, I mentioned already the trust in terms of rejection, the fear of rejection. So there we have exercises where you learn how to give the other person your Achilles heel, your sexual belt line. What you don't like and what you do not like and what you cannot stand. Now if you don't like something, you may, as Ms. Nicholson says, you may learn to like it. But there is within that range a limit. Like take again the caress. I learned to like her caress in more situations than previously. But there is one situation in which I never will learn it. And I want you to respect it. That's a baseline. You hear? What did I say? Do you believe it? Are you going to give up pushing me in this? And respect my baseline. I really, honey, I get so <laughs> nervous when I drive, especially in, in territory like Iowa. I don't in the middle of rain okay, anymore. Okay. What? I will try, but I need. <laughs> I don't. Uh, sometimes I do it unconsciously, and in those instances, I would like you to just give me a quiet reminder instead of getting mad. Well, the damage is done. Well, you just say, "Take your hand off," but instead of instead of "Don't touch me." I mm. heard you say I should not get angry. I don't like that. That's a restriction of my of feelings. Yes, but I am willing to help you to, I mean, to respect your belt line, and I am asking Sorry. that you help me in that. Right. And I'm asking you to please let me get angry and not interpret it as total rejection. I'm just rejecting that particular thing that you do. Show what you do while I'm driving. Dreadful. <laughs> now it feels good because I'm not driving. <laughs> feels good when... <laughs> So you know, do it again later, but, uh, but not when I'm going, okay, see, we have to work this out. I'm sure we'll work it out. As long as I, I let you know what my belt line is, rather than do the, like in the old days, to avoid rejection, you say all kinds of things to yourself rather than to your partner. Well, she should be divine. She should know better. If she really loves me, she should know what to do and not to do. See? It's called divining. Nonsense to divining. Don't divine. Find out. Leave the divining to God. Just be down on earth and find out what a person likes and doesn't like. And don't expect your partner to divine anything. Okay, I think we have Enough I mentioned. Oh, one more thing that's probably very essential. You, you, you may say to yourself, oh, why should I do all this, you know? Is it all worth it? Remember that there's a lot of cynicism about sexuality. Dreadful, lots and lots. I think Since there's more sexual activity, there's not necessarily more joy in it. There's just numerically more of it, possibly. And many people are, are cynical about it. 
Now that is one of the major things for you to find out. Whether you are sex exploited, whether your partner is one of those cynical who, to whom sex is not meaningful in a context of a relationship. And then if you have your choice, you have your choice to go that way, fine. But I'll tell you how you can find out very, very quickly. And that has to do with the question of goodwill in a conflict situation. In other words, it's the first time you have a quarrel, a lover's quarrel, which I hope is almost immediately from meeting each other and continuing love quarrels, continuing in a certain way. If you have these quarrels and the attitude in these quarrels that you want to watch out for is to learn how to differentiate between goodwill, anger, I mean hostility per se is all right if it's in the context of goodwill, the quality of goodwill, and I'll show you how to differentiate that. When it's in the context of ill will, you should confront that, you should protest that. Now here's the difference. The anger is the same, and I'll try to play it both ways, we'll role play, and then you will tell me, which I hope if I'm, if I'm a fairly good actor, this was my original profession before I became a psychologist, I was a juvenile star in, in Europe before I became a psychologist. So I'm going to play for you the two stances. And you will tell me, now watch, I'm supposed to be angry in both stances, equally angry, so don't, I give you a cue, don't worry about that. You cunt, bitch, castrating, ball-tickling cunt. I hate you, especially for making me say these things because deep inside, I don't like to feel this way towards you. It hurts me, but you are doing this shitty thing again and again and again. And again, I'm telling you, it's making me mad and I could kill you. I want you to stop doing that. You can't. You can't play any bitch. Version one. Finished. <laughs> Now, version two. Now, version two. Now, remember, you, you're supposed to distinguish your... And I'm throwing one little difference thing. But it is little. You bitch, you cunt. You castrating cunt. You no good bitch. You know what you are. You are a cunt. And everything you do with me, hurt me, I've told you again and again, typically you keep doing it. Typically you castrate, you hurt, and I could kill you. And I know your type. That's the way you are. A castrating bitch. Thank you. Now what is the, what's the difference and which of the two versions is goodwill and which of the two versions is ill will? And what's the difference? Who come on, speak up. How many of you think there is a difference? You're right. There's a difference. Now, which one, if generally, 
which one is, I give you a few. In a good will anger, there is, as well as an ill will anger, there is genuine hate, naturally, in both genuine hate. I hope I portrayed that. How, however, in the good will, there is a different, what is it? Which version was good will? How many of you say one? Thank you. How many of you say the second one? Oh, you are so clever. You must have read my book. You didn't though, did you? No. You're right. I'm applauding you. Thank you. Now, what is the difference? Come. Risk. The, the guilty, no, but stereotyping, yes. Stereotyping is always a sign, not always, but can be a sign of ill will, but it's not just stereotyping. There's one more aspect. You are right on the right track. Who can piggyback on that? It's, it, it's not that subtle. Remember in version one, my voice had a pleading quality. What was I pleading for? Change. Right, you are right. The, 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 that's good that you got that. The, 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 the point that you can always test if a person is willing, you know, in his anger, to ask you to change. Or when he says in an ill way, that's just typical of you, drop dead, so to speak, you know. As a matter of fact, in ill will, ill will relationships, they don't want you to change. Because in an ill will relationship, the object, yeah, is the hate object, is remained in the unattractive position. So we want also to work tonight on stereotypes. Now you have been very good and been sitting there. Now I want you to, with the help of, uh, of my assistant, whom I'm working with UCLA in many, many places, Louis Nicholson, we want to try an experiment in, in um, giving you an experience of sensing the dimensions of intimacy that I briefly talked to you about. And then tomorrow when you come, we'll go into uh, other, other dimensions. So I'm glad, you know, we have not only these hours, but also tomorrow morning to continue uh, with other dimensions uh, of uh, the relationship of aggression and sex. Okay, now what do we have in mind? We worked out a little menu. What would you like to do? Speak up. What do you want? Promenade. Would everyone please stand up? Remove your pillows and uh, blankets to the side, out of the middle of the floor. Yeah, we need to clear the middle of the ballroom. So you can bring your pillows also to the stage on the side and all your belongings. And we won't use the stage. You can put things here.
Well, I stay here. If you, with those steps. Oh yeah, I can go down that way. No problem. Then I'm, then I'm ready. Yes. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our first exercise requires for you to put everything aside because we need eventually your hands not only for gesticulation, but also for touching. So if you kindly put your things away and so you are free. Also, I need your imagination. And please now imagine that you are trans transposed. You've s you and Miss Nicholson is a fountain. You stay right in the middle and look around. You can look around. You're a human fountain in a marketplace, in a village. And you all are coming down to promenade. So I want you gentlemen to form the outside. In other words, all gentlemen, please come to the, to the very uh, wall, uh, the back. And you ladies stay more in the inner circle. Now I like you to listen carefully to, to these the following instructions. I want you to pretend that you are that you have never seen each other, never. That this is the first time that whether you are lay, uh, women or men, male or female, doesn't matter. You've never, you never, you're total strangers. And I would like you to, to now form little buddy ships with total strangers with whom you will promenade male, three buddies of males form together to walk around the fountain outside the ladies in this way. And three of the ladies will invite each other to be lady buddies and walk around in the opposite direction in the inner circle, but keep, it, keep the circle as wide as possible. So in other words, the first step, yeah, may I? Yes, you go ahead and select your buddies first. Go ahead, select your buddies. Ladies have three, triangles and gentlemen please find three gentlemen to walk with now we want everybody involved so please get your buddies lined up and you ladies start promenading as soon as you have your buddies you can promenade and the ladies go in which way did I say and the guys go this way and the gals go this way. So you turn around and start promenading. Now, may I have your attention for one more instruction, please? One more instruction. I want you, when you promenade, I want you to look over the three, the three, the ladies will look over the three gentlemen as you pass by and the three gentlemen will look over the th all the threes of the ladies, all of them. So don't stop walking, and you do not talk across the gender line at this point. You talk over, the gals talk over the guys, and the guys talk over the girls. And I want you, yeah, and I want you, yeah, and I want you to, to talk it over in terms of, in, in, term, in some new terms, in terms of who would or would not be a good lay. In other words, <laughs> now, 
Now remember, you can be very frank. You, uh, may I have your attention, please, for a moment? You remember this. Remember this. Please try to follow the instructions because you can be very frank because you are not going to share this communication across the gender line in this exercise. So you can be very frank with each other. It's very important that the exercise that you learn to verbalize and share with your own, with your own sex, with your own sex, the pros and cons of certain guys or gals you see. You do not have to make it known. This is just on a visual basis, on, and a lot of uh, it is totally imaginative, you see? Okay, now we want everybody in it, so we need some uh, logistics help. If you gentlemen do one thing logistically, it would help. If you stay as much on the periphery as possible, so that the circle is as large as this hall allows, which is adequate. And people who are with chairs there would please move those chairs away so, so, so we have total, or put them in the corners where you are not in the way. So we have a, like, a, like an arena, yeah? Like a, as large a circumference as possible. And you ladies, please keep moving, yeah? And gentlemen, keep moving. Okay, let's try it. Go ahead. Ladies, you go this way, that way. Gentlemen, that way. Go ahead, in threes. Now you can help with the instructions. Okay. Uh, please. Okay. Let's get started moving now. The guys this way, the gals that way. Come on, some of the guys are moving. Let's go. Move. Come on, the guys are started, but the girls aren't. The girls only talk to the girls, the guys only to the guys. No male-female communication. Let's move. You're not moving. The girls are very stationary. Let's go. You're not going to see very much if you stand still. The guys talk over with the guys and the girls with the girls. Come on, let's go. Let's go, girls. Move. Guys, stay on the outside and keep moving. Keep your eyes open. Promenade around. Just keep walking. Don't stop. Talk it over among yourselves, but not across the sex line. Let's go, move. These women have been in the same place the whole time almost. Huh? Let's go, keep moving, keep moving. Keep your eyes open. Don't talk. Girls, don't talk to the guys. Guys, don't talk to the girls. Keep moving. Let's go. You folks aren't moving too fast. Girls, don't talk to the guys, and guys, don't talk to the girls. Just talk among yourselves. Okay, ladies, move, move. Promenade. Come on, Keep ladies. Keep moving. Move. Remember, look them over for a good lay. You have to look them all over, so it means you have to move. Let's go.
Come on, girls, let's move. Promenade, promenade, keep going, keep going. Look them over good now, look them over good. Talk about it among yourselves, but not across the sex lines. Guys talk to guys and girls to girls. Keep moving, keep moving. Keep moving. Girls, keep moving. Guys, keep moving on the outside. Look them over good. Keep moving, keep moving. Women don't talk to the men, men don't talk to the women, just among yourselves. Look them over good. Keep moving, keep moving, don't stop. Keep the lines moving. Keep going. Keep the lines moving. Guys, look at the gals. Don't talk to them. Look them over good and keep moving. Tell your friends what you think. Keep the lines moving. Keep the lines moving. Girls don't talk to the guys. Guys don't talk to the girls. Look them over good. Now, if you, if you have made your circle, you can now select, you can now select three, uh, three of you, select three, in other words, three guys and three girls will select. And since we have about uh, a little bit unequal number, don't worry about it. If, your subgroup that you're now going to form to do these exercises with uh, doesn't include exactly six, you know, if you have, let's say, five or seven, and if there may be uh, three gals and two guys, don't be too squeamish about it, but don't make your group too big because you won't be able to follow all the exercises. So make your maximum group you're going to form seven and your minimum five. Are you, please follow my instructions. Seven or five. Now be sure that in your, I don't care how you select them, but be sure you have in that group someone you would like to lay. <laughs> so go ahead and you, 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 you go ahead now, make your selection, and when you have, just a moment, just a moment. 
All right, just a moment. One more, one more instruction. Listen to me. One more instruction. When you found, you should work with your buddies. You know, you should work with the people you've been talking to. As soon as you have your five, six, or seven, I want you to sit in a little cluster in the middle of the ballroom where Laurie is around there. As soon as you have your group, go sit down so I, you can get your cushions too, okay? And get your cushions and sit down. So I know that you have formed your cluster. Go ahead, form clusters, don't be left out. Now, as soon as you have your cluster, please sit together in a huddle, in a nice close huddle. No more than seven. So you Now learn how to select and reject. Okay, we need the we need the clusters now. Please form your clusters and don't get left out. Just assert yourself and say come into my cluster. I Please restrict your cluster to seven people. Do not make it too large because that shows you don't know how to reject intruders. Let them form their own groups. And don't go away. You can form all male groups if you wish. We Laurie, will you help the people to form the groups there? You people standing there, do you need any help? Shall I auction you off? <laughs> 